Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, trends and opinions from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening I'm joined by Lance Izumi. He's the Education Director at the Pacific Research Institute. He's an author, all-around good guy, I'm told. <laughs> Lance, thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks very much, Chris. It's terrific to be on your show. Well, thank you. And so, tell us a little bit about Lance the Man. Who are you? How did you arrive at this point in life? Well, I appreciate that. I, 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 it's been a, basically a pretty long road. Uh, you know, I started off life as a recovering lawyer. And <laughs> Sorry to hear that. I know, right? Uh, and then, um, but then I uh, went actually into my first uh, job really out of law school was not, uh, you know, in uh, doing law, but I was a political speech writer for a number of years. I was a speech writer for Attorney General Ed Meese in President Reagan's administration. And then I was the chief speech writer for Governor George Duke Majin after that. And, uh, you know, after writing speeches for, you know, the uh, terrific people, I decided that I really wanted to uh, kind of write under my own byline, which is why I went into the think tank business and wor worked for the Claremont Institute for a while, uh, a conservative think tank down in Southern California, and then uh, now have been with the Pacific Research Institute for, gosh, more than 20 years now. Right. So how does one go from law school, which in, at least in California is not known for being consider uh, and very um, conservative as a whole, um, and then shaping words to shaping thought uh, in a conservative mindset. I mean, that's almost like asking for trouble. Well, you know, it, uh, you know, when I, I was an undergraduate and while I was in law school, I did a, a fair amount of freelance writing, often for my college dailies. And so, you know, to, to their credit, you know, I had a obviously a very conservative point of view, but they were very willing to, you know, publish my pieces. So I wrote uh, for the Daily Bruin, I also wrote for the law school uh, publication at USC where I was, uh, well, I was in law school, I was at UCLA as an undergraduate. And, um, you know, I also st uh, wrote for different conservative publications on a freelance basis. And it was actually from there that, uh, you know, I made the jump after law school to start writing speeches for uh, elected officials. Uh, and uh, actually my very first job out of law school was actually working for Mike Antonovich, who is a conservative Los Angeles County supervisor. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I went from there, you know, uh, to work for Ed Meese in Washington and then uh, Governor Duke Majin in Sacramento. So then from there you went into the think tank business, as you said. So which came first, the think tank business or the authorship uh, direction? Well, you know, I, I, I've always been, you know, um, uh, you know, everybody's got their talents, and you know, I've always been uh, a person who enjoyed writing, mm -hmm. and so, and I always wanted, I always thought that the best job in the world would actually be to have a job where I could basically write about ideas, uh -huh. and uh, you know, I thought that uh, you know uh, that might be as a columnist or you know, working for a think tank, and it turned out after you know cutting my teeth as a speechwriter, I was able to actually make that come true by going into the think tank business. Mm -hmm. And uh, so right now uh, at Pacific Research Institute, uh, not only do I write studies, I write books you know, for the Institute, I also write op-ed pieces for them on education issues. And I was just recently uh, named a uh, opinion contributor to Education Week, which is the nation's top education publication. A conservative writing for education publications that are not, <laughs> wow, you do ask for trouble. Well, yes, you know, but you know, it, uh, it's a, what's a good thing is that, you know, uh, publications like Education Week do want to have a diversity of uh, opinion. And, you know, I, so I think that that's the important thing is to be able to get one's ideas out there, sure. even to people who may not be at first receptive to it, you know, but, uh, you know, hopefully the things that I write from a more conservative point of view uh, make people think twice about their assumptions about subjects that they thought that they, you know, had a, uh, you know, uh, a died in the wool opinion. Right, and I do want to tap on that some more because you know conservatives aren't known for compassion or caring, and for some reason, um, the liberal mindset is the one that's supposed to be compassionate about education and everything else. Where if you do look at how analytical many conservatives mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. you would see that education would make sense to them. They're just not necessarily always as vocal about it. But it's one of those topics that really brings us together. We all care about having right. kids that can function in the world and 
think for themselves theoretically. And um, so I want to tap on that more. But your most recent book is called The Corrupt Classroom. That's right. How many books have you written in the book form? Obviously, you're prolific and you've done lots of things with words, but a book specifically? Well, I've written a number of books. You know, my first book was actually uh, written, back, I wrote it back in 2005, around the time of Hurricane Katrina, actually. It was a book on model charter schools in California. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote about uh, charter schools were, you know, a relatively recent uh, phenomenon back then. And so I wrote about uh, those that were performing very well in the state. And it was called Free to Learn was the name of the book. And actually, I was very uh, heartened by the fact that back then, uh, a number of the folks who were trying to reestablish the uh, school system back in New Orleans after the, the hurricane uh, actually used my book, uh, you know, to, you know, to help, you know, uh, the process back there of getting the school system back on its feet. Right. And so uh, I went back there uh, and did some training for some school principals, you know, uh, at that time. And uh, so that was a, a great impact to have in something that was uh, obviously something terrible and serious, but hopefully now that, uh, you know, New Orleans is, um, uh, had a bit of an education renaissance, right. you know, because of the fact that, you know, so many of the schools there now are charter schools. Right. And so, you know, uh, so I thought that was a, that's a great start to my book writing career. And uh, I've written books on um, uh, blended education, blended learning, which is the melding of computer-assisted education with traditional classroom uh, education. Uh, my book that uh, just came out actually a couple years ago called Moonshots in Education uh, was written, uh, co-authored with uh, somebody here in the Silicon Valley, Esther Wojcicki, who is a, a journalism teacher at uh, Palo Alto High School. And so we co-authored this book together and uh, it's done quite well, uh, you know, looking at uh, this phenomenon uh, and this education revolution really mm -hmm. of uh, blended learning. And I think it's really the way of the future. Well, and it makes sense that it doesn't have to be an either or. You right. still need humans yes. adding their component and you can use technology to enable them. But you've, you've used a couple of words, rewords, yes. um, that are intriguing to me as to how you define them. So when you talk about education renaissance or revolution, and to me it sounds like rebirth would be another yeah. reword mm -hmm. that would be in there. How are you defining that transition? What was the old? What's the new? Well, I think that, that you know, uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, like, f uh, for example, Sal Khan of the Khan Academy, which is very well known, you know, throughout the world, really, and, uh, you know, certainly had, Sal had his uh, start, you know, bringing that uh, concept here in the Silicon Valley area. Um, you know, he talks about uh, how before we had this, uh, you know, infusion of education technology in the classroom and all the possibilities that it brings, you had basically a Prussian style teaching model or learning model where you had a whole classroom where all the kids are marching basically in lockstep, you know, uh, with the teacher basically calling all the shots. Mm -hmm. uh, and what education uh, technology does is that it kind of unleashes the ability of individuals to be able to uh, go as fast and as rapidly as, uh, you know, they are able to do so, not because the curriculum tells them that they need to be at a certain point, not because the teacher tells them they have to be here or there. You know, it's really up to the individual, and the technology allows them to be able to basically reach their individual potential and not be tied to, uh, you know, the assumptions uh, of, uh, you know, the whole class class or, you know, far away district or state officials. Right. So you're, you're actually talking about a model where the education system can adapt to the child versus the kids who may or may not be able to to adapt to the system. That's exactly right. You know, so it's really you know that that personalized learning that uh, we all really want for our children. And uh, you know, so uh, the, the education software that's out there right now uh, and that's being used in you know many schools, whether it's uh, charter schools or in regular public schools uh, or in private schools, that uh, you know th that software now is able to meet kids where they are and see where their trajectory is, how they can raise their performance, and, uh, you know, so that they are um, uh, able to blossom as a person <clears throat> and not, uh, again, uh, be forced to be part of a whole army of other kids. Right. 
Well, I mean, my wife's a teacher and has been for 25 years in a Montessori system, which mm -hmm. is all about follow the child and, yes. and adapt to their needs. And what's interesting about this model is there may be kids who have a very strong aptitude toward mathematics, as mm -hmm. an example, others with English or whatever. But what you're talking about is a model where they can actually play to their strengths, mm -hmm. but not be so beaten down by some of the things that maybe are areas for improvement, to right. use a politically correct type of a statement, so that... It, this could actually help with things like self-esteem or other things yeah, so that yeah. they could see something that they actually perform in versus being bogged down with the, with the failure points, right? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. I, I did a, another book called Short Circuited, uh, which looked at the online learning revolution here in California. Mm -hmm. And I did a, also a, a video based upon that book. And one of the uh, things I did was I looked at the examples of uh, you know, individual students mm -hmm. who are able to make use of uh, this uh, online uh, learning revolution and uh, one of the kids that I, uh, you know, uh, profiled was a boy who had uh, autism, and uh, he his needs were not being met in his traditional public school, and uh, he was therefore uh, homeschooled by his parents, but using uh, uh, these uh, new education software through an online model, and uh, you know he was able to really blossom as uh, you know a, a, a learner, and so whereas he had been failing or doing very badly, you know, in the traditional public school setting, you know, when he was able to uh, use the technology, the software in, uh, that met him at where he was and uh, be able to raise him up from there, you know, he was able to really prosper and do extremely well in his studies. Right. And so you've talked about several things. Uh, you're talking about technology, you're talking about homeschooling options, charter school options, and a lot of these, at least within the California context, tend to raise temper levels mm -hmm. among certain crowds, but you're making it sound like these things could work for the right student. Yeah, and Are I, you a, an advocate of choice or something like that? <laughs> you know, well, certainly I am an advocate of choice, but you know, the, the thing of it is, is that, you know, this is choice for all kids, you know, mm -hmm. not just kids who, you know, conservative, with conservative parents or uh, kids who have uh, parents who have, believe in, you know, certain religious philosophies or whatever. These, you know, whoever you are as a child and whoever your parents are, you should have the ability to go to the school or the type of learning situation that best meets your individual needs. Right. And so uh, no one has a claim on you right. as an individual to you know, say that you got to do it just this one way right. and that there should be no options for you. Right. And so uh, you know, that's why I think that you know, when you look at uh, you know, countries, for example, like Sweden, for, uh, which have a universal school choice system where kids can go to whichever school, public or private, that they want to. What's interesting is that, uh, you know, the entire country, whether you're, you know, they're from the left or from the right, you know, parents support uh, those choices because, you know, it, they want to have the best uh, schooling for their kids. Right. And it does, it's not a matter of political ideology. Right. And so with whole other countries doing this type of thing and having choice and still being held up as being successful, these are things that can still be managed even if there's a less of a perceived control from unions or bureaucrats or whatever. All of these things can be put through a system so that you, you are somewhat monitoring the, the outcomes, correct? Yes, you know, and so, I mean, you look, uh, again, you know, you look at uh, countries such as Sweden and other places that have uh, these choice models that they're, they're using. Um, you know, uh, part of the way that there's accountability is simply the competition between, you know, the various systems. Now you're using words like competition in yeah, education. That's Just... exactly right, yeah, but, uh, you know, what's interesting is that uh, when, uh, I, I wrote a book called Not As Good As You Think, which uh, looked at the uh, underperformance of middle class kids uh, here in uh, California. And I uh, did um, a video uh, based upon that book where I actually went to Sweden and I interviewed the governor of Stockholm at the time, who was the former uh, minister of education in Sweden, where this universal choice program had come in. And one of the th uh, things that he told me in that interview was that um, he was uh, surprised to learn that once they introduced this competition through this choice system, that the headmasters of the public schools came to him and said that, well, if those guys in the private sector are doing this or that, then we can do it and better. 
so that you know it uh, forced them to look at the situation in a different way and also incentivize them to raise their performance. And so it's not just the kids that need to raise their performance, it's the administration and the staff inside the schools too? Again, more crazy talk. Yeah, more crazy <laughs> talk, but uh, common sense talk. Because you I do, think. I, I think that, uh, again, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, we, we think in a place like Sweden, which, uh, you know, is viewed in many ways as a socialistic country, mm -hmm. but uh, yet, um, you know, when it came to education, you know, you uh, ended up having a, a much more market-oriented system. Yeah. And so I think that, uh, you know, what, you know, the lesson there is that, a, a, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Right. And you know whether it's the kids who decide to go into the uh, uh, private system or kids who remained in the public system, that the performance, uh, uh, you know, rose amongst all. Well, and it's also interesting that that even within socialistic types of societies, mm -hmm. competition can be an improvement mm -hmm. point. Yes, it, that's interesting. So let's talk about the most recent book, The Corrupt Classroom. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, the top three things in that book that you would just hope people would recognize and uh, possibly strive to make changes toward? Well, I, th I think that it, the reason why I wrote the book the corrupt classroom in the first place was that you know, we've been talking about choice, and uh, you know I've talked a little bit about uh, the academic performance of students, you know, in various settings. Um, but that's not the only reason why parents want to make a choice about which school or learning situation they want their kids to uh, be in. Uh, you know, it could be a lot of non-academic reasons. For example, I mean, it could be that your son or daughter's classroom is very politicized. And you feel that they're not being taught, you know, they're being indoctrinated. Right. Or else, you know, it could be that uh, the your son or daughter may feel that uh, they are unsafe in that school setting. That makes it hard to study if you feel like you're going to be killed at any moment. Well, exactly right. Or at least beaten. You know, I mean, lots of bad things, uh, you know, follow from the feeling of being unsafe, not just that you could actually be physically harmed, but you know, you could, you know, have depression, you could, you know, feel this sense of uh, loneliness, you could have anxiety, all of these sorts of things uh, that will Im uh, impact your performance academically right. is because of how you feel about your environment, about your safety within that school. Mm -hmm. um, and also, too, you know, you could uh, have uh, issues involving the fiscal management or mismanagement of schools and school districts. And that has an impact on uh, the classroom. You know, you may not have resources. You may not have, you know, certain activities. You may not have the best teachers, all of which because, you know, uh, officials have made the wrong fiscal decisions at a higher level. Right. And so, but all, and on all of those things don't seem at first to involve academics, but they're uh, the impact academics, and there are also reasons why parents may decide that, hey, you know, I, I don't like what's going on in my school, and I would really love to have a different situation for my child. Right. So if we could just spend a moment or two on each of those three subjects, and give me an example. I mean, anyone can say a classroom is politicized or unsafe or fiscally mismanaged, but there are there a couple of high points for each of them that just really stand out into your mind? If people hadn't thought about it on that level, that if they smell this, this could be the problem? Well, you know, I think that, you know, you just have to, you know, look, uh, for example, like, let's say the uh, politicization of the classroom. Sure. And you know, uh, there's always been you know, it's, and it's, uh, because we're human, the institutions of these education systems, and you're going to have some of that leak in. But it just seemed, for example, that uh, during the 2016 election, that everything went off the rails when it came to uh, the politicization of the classroom. And my book, The Corrupt Classroom, uh, documents you know across the country uh, where teachers were doing just outlandish things. Uh, I mean, for example, you had a teacher in Colorado who. Put a picture of President Trump or Donald Trump at that time. Yeah. His uh, picture on a, a pinata, and you know, basically had students take a whack at the pinata as part of a classroom activity. You know, a parent there, you know, in Colorado said, "Why is this happening in a school setting? Right. You know, why try and divide people when you know schools are supposed to bring people together?" Right. And uh, you know, you, uh, you had a, a parent in um, North Carolina, for example, who were complaining that. The, their English teacher at the local high school was comparing Donald Trump to Adolf Hitler and, you know, uh, making incredibly disparaging remarks about right. uh, the president there. And, uh, you know, unfortunately for those parents, 
and I have some quotes from them in the book, you know, they felt constrained from letting, you know, people know that they felt um, that this was um, impacting their child and, and impacting them as uh, um, parents because they felt that the school system beat down anybody who disagreed with kind of the prevailing uh, ideology right. that, within the, uh, the, the, the district. And so, you know, so parents, you know, whether, you know, in whatever part of the country and whichever party or whichever candidate right. they support, they shouldn't feel that way. Right. You know, and if they do feel that way, they should have options for their child. Sure. And, Okay, and so then from a safety perspective, um, what kinds of things were you seeing as you were writing the book? Well, you know, there are individual examples just all across America, you know, I mean, for example, I, one of the examples I, I, I mentioned is a, a little nine-year-old girl in Alabama who um, was beaten up uh, very badly at her school, and that's bad enough, but when the uh, mother, when her mom came to the school to pick her up, the uh, the, the school nurse there lied to the mom and said that the child had not been beaten up but had accidentally fallen. And repeatedly? Repeatedly. Yeah, well, that, that and happens. Even, <laughs> even though this child was suffering from a concussion and was bleeding profusely at the time, uh, the, she managed to uh, pipe up and thankfully say to her mom, no mom, I told them that this other girl jumped me. Right. And uh, so, of course, the uh, mother was shocked at this and then went to the principal and asked the principal what was going to be done about the perpetrator. And the principal assured her that the um, perpetrator would be suspended. And what it turned out was never suspended. And so, therefore, you know, that's the kind of thing where, um, you know, and, and so it's unsurprising that the parent then took the child out of the uh, school and is now homeschooling her. Right. And so, you know, that kind of thing is just, uh, you know, one example out of thousands and thousands across America, you know, where you have 65% uh, of America's public schools reporting one or more incidents of violence, you know, happening at their campuses. And, and in middle schools, you have 88% of uh, the middle schools in this country reporting uh, one or more incidents of violence, all of which translates to about three quarters of a million crimes, you know, uh, in uh, school campuses. And so that's really a shocking statistic. Sure. And so mismanagement, I mean, what's the biggest mismanagement aspect that you're seeing from a fiscal? Uh, well, I think that, you know, when you look at, for example, here in California, uh, where places like Los Angeles Unified School District, where, um, you know, they are now facing a, you know, uh, more than $400 million deficit in the, um, by, in 2019, I believe. The, and it's because of, uh, you know, actions, voluntary actions by, you know, the school board in terms of negotiating various contracts, giving out uh, various benefits to special interest groups within the, the school district, even though they, in Los Angeles, for example, ha have been warned about these practices by their own appointed officials. I think that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's pretty shocking that, uh, and, and what it tells you is that what's more important uh, to some of these school boards are the special interests uh, within their, those districts as opposed to the children for whom the uh, education is and the, the learning system is supposed to exist in the first place. Right. And so we've only got about a minute left, and I would love to hear about solutions. I'm sure others would as well, but it sounds like they're going to have to look you up elsewhere to make <laughs> that happen and to figure out. Yeah, I'm sure you have solutions as far as... Absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, both in the, my book, The Corrupt Classroom, and in my other publications, you know, I, again, we've been talking about school choice, uh, and, you know, really what we need in California and across the country are uh, systems which allow uh, parents to be able to choose their school and not be locked in to just one public school in their zip code. Okay. Uh, you need to have, you know, whether it's through an education savings account, a tax credit, or some other mechanism that gives a parent an immediate exit ticket for their child if they're in a situation that they don't want to be in. Okay. Well, if you'll hold on for just a moment, we've appreciated all of your knowledge. We'll be back after a word from our underwriters, the conservative, and now called the Liberty Forum. Some people think that a meeting of conservatives in Silicon Valley could fit in a small room. In fact, when the Conservative Forum was founded in 2003, we did meet in a small room, a coffee shop in San Jose. It doesn't get more grassroots than this. 
It may surprise you that there are thousands of people right here in Silicon Valley who share your principles of liberty, free markets, and limited government. Since our humble beginnings in that coffee shop, we've outgrown three meeting halls. From San Jose to Gilroy to Mill Valley, we bring hundreds of people together each month from all over the Bay Area to promote the principles of American liberty. How do we do it? It starts with a stellar lineup of speakers. Speakers like Steve Forbes, Senator Jim DeMint, Dr. Victor Davis Hansen, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, Andrew Breitbart, Pamela Geller, and many others. These speakers passionately articulate our shared principles and remind us why conservatism isn't just the smart choice, it's also the moral choice. Our monthly meetings are only one dimension of the forum. We underwrite The Right Side, a monthly television show on cable access channel KMVT. We also host a monthly constitution discussion group and provide tables at our meetings for more than a dozen local groups who share our love of liberty to promote their specific cause. The Conservative Forum is the premier place in Silicon Valley for conservatives to gather, become invigorated, motivated, and empowered. We welcome guests to our monthly meetings and offer special discounted pricing to first-time visitors. Take a look at our speaker lineup in the coming months and join us to learn why we say liberty is made in America. <laughs> and that was a word from our underwriters, the Liberty Forum. Now, what they're best known for is not the show, even though they're underwriting us now for the seventh season, but it's their speaker series, which is why we have Lance with us in the studio this evening. After he leaves here, he'll be rushed across to the other side of town and we'll be presenting there at the IFES Portuguese Hall at 432 Sterling Road here in Mountain View. But in February, Dr. Gary Wolfram, who's a professor of economics and public policy at Hillsdale College, will be there. And in March, I'm sure it's going to be a packed house for Ann Coulter, columnist and author. There's also a special presentation that'll be happening at the end of January. Um, uh, where uh, Michael Medved will be speaking. You can find out more information about that at theconservativeforum.com or soon at the, uh, the new Liberty uh, Forum website. In closing, normally at this point, you would be getting a kiss goodbye from me and we'd be going, but we ran a little short. So Lance, I just wanted to ask you, if somebody wants more information and more of your solutions, obviously they can find your work at Pacific Research Institute or by Googling you, is there a website you'd like them to go to? Absolutely. They should go to www.pacificresearch, all one word, pacificresearch.org. Okay. Excellent. And so um, we do encourage you to go back and look Lance up. If there's more information or if you'd like a way to just throw firing darts at him, um, then go ahead and do that. But in the interim, we've enjoyed having you on the show and having a chance to share Lance with you this evening. If you have questions uh, or comments, you can reach out to us at therightsidetv at gmail.com. Uh, or um, uh, you can maybe run into us in person or on the show sometime soon. Thanks for joining us. I've been your host, Chris Pereja. This has been The Right Side, and we will see you again soon. Have a great day.